You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This year, build your credit history with the Chime Secured Credit Builder Visa Credit Card. No credit checks to apply. Get started at Chime.com slash build. The Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card is issued by the Bancorp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. members FDIC. Chime checking account and a 200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three-pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the prize picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War episode 199, Legacies. This is our 16th and last episode on the Paris Peace Conference, and today we are going to be talking about two topics. The first will be the final days before the Germans signed their treaty, the Treaty of Versailles, and then we will touch just briefly on the legacy of the treaty around the world. For the Germans and for the Allied leaders as well, the presence of Germany at the conference and the final decisions on the German issues was the climax of the discussions. It saw many of the various pieces of conflict that had been experienced at the conference all come together. Wilson and his 14 points and how they did and did not apply to certain topics, like Germany. French and British antagonism around how much to punish the countries that they had defeated. German quests to minimize the punishments they received, citing their change in government. Those are just a few examples. In some ways, everything that we have discussed up to this point relates to the quest to find an agreement between the Allied leaders on the topic of Germany. As for the legacy of the treaty, this will certainly not be my final word on the treaty's effects on the post-war world, or a final judgment on its failures or successes. In some ways, our episodes over the course of the rest of this year will act as part of that judgment. What can absolutely be stated is that the conference and the treaties that it created would cast a long shadow throughout the next several decades, and historians and political commentators would spend the next 100 years, and counting, blaming it for many of the world's problems. Some of this blame is probably justified, but some of it is not. Before we talk about the years after 1919, we do need to find out how the Treaty of Versailles was actually signed. The German delegation that arrived in Paris was led by Count Ulrich von brockdorf ransau who was the Weimar government's foreign minister. When he arrived in Paris, he, like many in the German delegation, hoped that they would be able to have a long and protracted negotiation with the Allies. This would not be allowed, and instead the Germans were told that they would only be allowed to make some written notes on the treaty that was presented to them. There would be only one chance for the Germans to speak publicly, and this chance would occur on May the 7th, when they received the text of the proposed treaty in front of the conference. For this event, Brockdorf Ransau had prepared two different speeches, one that was short and one that was longer and quite a bit more defiant. When he arrived, he chose the longer of the two. When he presented this speech, there were two problems for Brockdorf Ransau that were totally outside of his control. The first was that the room was arranged that the German delegation was placed in what looked very much like a prisoner's dock in a courtroom. This caused Brockdorf Ransau to decide not to stand when delivering his speech, to avoid looking like a prisoner. The second problem was that the interpreter was not very good, which meant that this message did not really come across to those in the room that did not speak German, which was most of the people in the room. 
During his speech, he would discuss many different topics, with special focus on the War Guilt Clause. The Germans had not read the treaty at this point, but the rumors of its contents were strong enough to allow the Germans to speak to its specifics, like for War Guilt. When addressing this clause, Brockdorf Ranzau would say, quote, Such a confession in my mouth would be a lie. We are far from declining any responsibility from this great war of the world that has come to pass, but we deny that Germany and its people were alone guilty. He also pointed to the fact that the Allied blockade of Germany had lasted for months after the end of the conflict, causing huge hardship upon the German people. Unfortunately, most of these points did not really make it through the translation intact. Due to the communication challenges, the views of the Allied leaders towards Germany were not at all improved by this speech. Wilson would say, quote, This is the most tactless speech I have ever heard. The Germans really are a stupid people. They always do the wrong thing. Lloyd George would say, It was deplorable that we let him talk. Obviously, these were very negative, but of course the leaders were not predisposed to accept and enjoy any German speech, so it's unlikely that anything Brockdorf Ranzau could have said in this moment would have greatly changed the German situation. The views of the Allied leaders did not really matter, though. What mattered was the contents of the treaty. When the treaty was given to the Germans, they made sure that it reached their team of translators as quickly as possible. They would spend all night creating a German translation from the French copy that they were given. The next morning, this was provided to the rest of the German delegation. Brockdorf Ransau would say that, quote, This fat volume was quite unnecessary. They could have expressed the whole thing more simply in one clause. Germany surrenders all claims to its existence. Regardless of his views, the delegation went to work to craft a counter-proposal. The general thrust of these German proposals is that the document as written was not a fair treaty, which the Germans believed they had been promised by the terms of the armistice. This reaction was almost expected by the Allied leaders, with one American diplomat writing, quote, The Germans have little left but hope. But having only that, I think they have clung to it. The hope that the Americans would do something, the hope that the final terms would not be so severe as the armistice indicated, and so on. Subconsciously, I think the Germans have been more optimistic than they realized. When they see the terms in cold print, there will be intense bitterness, hate, and desperation. Even though the German responses were somewhat expected, they still had some effects on the Allied leaders. These effects were strongest on the British side. When the Germans sent their official response to the treaty on May 29th, Henry Wilson would write privately that, quote, The Bosches have done exactly what I forecast. They have driven a coach and four through our terms, and then have submitted a complete set of their own, based on the 14 points, which are much more coherent than ours. Lloyd George was sufficiently concerned to put together a meeting of the leaders of the British delegation. During this meeting, Smuts would say that the peace terms would produce political and economic chaos in Europe for a generation, and in the long run it would be the British Empire that would have to pay the penalty. These concerns were coming up very late in the game, but Lloyd George would still go to the other leaders and state that he might not be able to sign the treaty, and this would have been a disaster. The entire treaty and how it interacted with all the other agreements that had been made with all the other countries in Europe was like a house of cards. It would be incredibly difficult to try and change any major piece of the German treaty without having to relitigate a cascading set of other concerns that had already been decided. Eventually, Lloyd George would be talked off the ledge with a few small changes, and then a guarantee that the people of Upper Silesia would be given a plebiscite instead of just being pulled outright into Poland. From the point that the Germans responded to the treaty until the Allies agreed on these small changes was about a month. But then on June 16th, the German delegations were told that they would have just three days to either sign the treaty or reject it. There was a general understanding that if they did not sign it, the war would resume. Even with the drastically reduced military footprint, there were still 40 Allied divisions that were ready to march into Germany when the order arrived. The German delegation would eventually get a small extension until June 23rd instead of the 19th, but that is all that they would get. With such a tight deadline, there was chaos in Berlin. As soon as the original draft had been translated, it had been communicated back to Berlin. It was much worse than any of the Germans believed that it would be. The president of the National Assembly would say, quote, The unbelievable has happened. The enemy presents us a treaty surpassing the most pessimistic forecasts. It means the annihilation of the German people. It is incomprehensible that a man who had promised the world a peace of justice, upon which a society of nations would be founded, has been able to assist in the framing of this project, dictated by hate. 
When news reached the German people, there was overall a feeling that Germany simply should not sign the treaty. There was also a general sense of betrayal, especially directed towards Wilson, who had come into the war speaking very highly of his 14 points, of peace without victory, and all of that, little of which was present in the treaty. With the reaction to the treaty so negative, and then the almost total rejection of any possible German alterations or negotiations in general, the German government found itself at a bit of a crossroads. The cabinet was divided, with eight against signing the treaty and just six supporting it. When the question was put to the parties, they were also divided. From his position in Paris, Brockdorf Rantzau was strongly against accepting the treaty as it was written. He would send along his recommendation, supported by the rest of the delegation, that it should not be signed. With the message, quote, the conditions of peace are still unbearable, for Germany cannot accept them and continue to live with honor as a nation. He would join many other German leaders in believing that the Allies were bluffing and that they would not be able to muster the men, materiel, or public support to fully occupy Germany, or even to invade it in the first place. There was also the hope that if Germany refused to sign, then the Allied leaders would be forced to either renegotiate or restart hostilities, a decision that was destined to be very unpopular at home. If it was unpopular enough, then those Allied leaders would be replaced by somebody else, and maybe they would be more accepting of actual negotiations. While this viewpoint was shared with some in the German cabinet, it would never be enough to sway them all. With the cabinet in a deadlock, they eventually resigned, and Brockdorf Rantzau resigned with them. This was done on June 20th, just three days before the treaty either had to be resigned or rejected. President Ebert did not resign, although there were some discussions about him doing so. Instead of resigning, he began the task of trying to cobble together a government as quickly as possible. A key player in these last 72 hours before the treaty had to be accepted was the German military. At this point, they, or what was left of them, were led by General Wilhelm Groner, and he had made one thing very clear to the politicians in Berlin. Successful resistance against an Allied invasion was out of the question. There were not enough troops available to put up any resistance against the French, let alone the Poles and the Czechs, who would almost certainly move in from the east. If Germany did not sign, then they would be invaded from all sides by groups that saw Germany not just as an enemy, but also the enemy. Any resistance by the German military would be token resistance at best, and quickly swept aside. There were some within the German government that would never agree that signing the treaty was the correct move. Of these, there were primarily two groups. On the far right, you had the conservatives and the militarists, and on the far left, you had the socialists and the communists. On the left, the Communist Party of Germany would say that acceptance of the treaty would lead the country down the path of bourgeois misery. Instead of choosing this path, they advised rejecting the treaty, causing the Western capitalists to waste resources trying to occupy and pacify Germany. Then, when the current government had been overthrown, the revolution could begin. On May 18th, the Communist Party would publish a document called Basic Principles of Peace, which said, among many other things, that, quote, the only possible and unavoidable solution is the overthrow of this government and of the bourgeois rule altogether, the establishment of a proletarian dictatorship, and so the participation in the world revolution. On the complete other end of the political spectrum, you had people like Hindenburg. He understood Groner's concerns and agreed with his assessment on the likely outcome of an Allied invasion. However, instead of rejecting this outcome, he believed that the country should embrace it. Trusting in the unity of the German people, he believed that they should let the French invade and then make an occupation as difficult as possible. In the long run, Germany could not be destroyed, according to Hindenburg, but by letting the French waste their time and resources trying to control the country, it would weaken Germany's enemies while uniting the German people towards a common enemy. He would say that, quote, the final consequence of a French occupation of the South, after what of course would be a difficult year, would be a renewal of the belief in the German Reich, and would hardly be more dangerous to German unity than signing a destructive peace agreement, leading to a misery from which the leadership would bear the blame. The German government in Berlin rejected both of these options, and the inevitable suffering and death that would have been experienced by the German people because of them, although they would later revisit some of these concepts when the French threatened to invade again in 1923. With the resistance not considered a viable option, Ebert and the cabinet that he threw together moved towards acceptance. They put the treaty before the National Assembly, which debated it for many hours. Eventually, they would agree to signing the treaty with one condition, that Germany did not recognize that Germany was responsible for the war, and they did not agree with the war guilt clause contained within the treaty. 
The, the official language of what they said was, quote, the government of the German Republic is ready to sign the peace treaty without thereby acknowledging that the German people are the responsible authors of the war and without accepting Articles 227 to 231, which were the war guilt clauses. This acceptance would pass with a reasonable margin, 237 to 138. A key part of getting this vote passed was that those who voted against the treaty promised not to question the patriotism of those who voted to accept the treaty, at least in public. This agreement was considered critical because everyone knew how unpopular the treaty was among the people. When the proposal was put before the Allies that the Germans would accept the treaty but not the war guilt clauses, the Allies rejected it, and they made it very clear that the only option that the Germans had was to accept or reject the treaty as it was written, as it had been provided to them. This news arrived back in Berlin at 9 p.m. on June 22nd, mere hours before an answer was required. At 3 a.m., the leaders halted discussions for the night, but they were back in session at 8 a.m. The parties were once again deeply divided, and no majority could be found to support the treaty as it was written. The cabinet then stepped in and announced that it would accept the treaty, under the reasoning that the assembly had just the day before voted to accept the treaty, even if it had at that point wanted some alterations. The cabinet believed that with just hours remaining, this was the only way to get the treaty signed, and they believed that signing it was the only viable option. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. With the decision made in Berlin, news would not arrive back in Paris until 5.40 p.m. on the 23rd. It was only at that point that the delegations would know what they were supposed to do. Once this news arrived, the conference was released for the rest of the day, and I'm sure there was no shortage of partying in Paris. It would not be until five days later that the treaty would actually be signed. Now, after the resignation of Brockdorf Ransau, it became necessary to find a new group of representatives to sign the treaty. This actually proved quite difficult, since many German politicians did not want to attend, or maybe disagreed with signing the treaty in the first place. Eventually, enough representatives were found, led by Hermann Mueller, who was the new Minister of Foreign Affairs, and who only went because he felt like it was his duty. On the 28th, the ceremony began with a speech by Clemenceau, and then the German delegates were brought out into the room at Versailles. Mueller would say that, quote, I wanted our ex-enemies to see nothing of the deep pain of the German people, whose representative I was at this tragic moment. They had brought their own pens so that they would not have to use the French ones, and then they signed the treaty, making sure to show as little emotion as possible. As soon as it was done, a signal went out all over Paris and then the world. In France, artillery guns let off a quick cannonade to celebrate. The war, at least between Germany and the Allies, was officially over. 
Mueller would say after arriving back at his hotel that, quote, a cold sweat such as I've never known in my life before broke out all over my body. A physical reaction was necessarily followed by unutterable psychic strain. And now for the first time, I knew that the worst hour of my life lay behind me. The German delegation left Paris that very night. In the hours after the treaty was signed, Paris and Berlin represented mere images in terms of their reaction. Paris was a scene of rejoicing and excitement. The war was officially over. In Berlin, there was mourning. The war was officially over. There was also the beginning of what would eventually turn into active resistance by some groups within Germany. In Berlin, as flags that had been confiscated during the Franco-Prussian War were brought out of storage to be sent back to France, a group of German military veterans seized them and burned them. Elsewhere in Germany, many citizens and former soldiers felt betrayed by their government and their leaders. While this did not lead to very much open violence, at least at the moment, it would lead to many in Germany believing that the only path forward was through, at the very least, passive non-compliance with the treaty. This non-compliance movement among the German people was just the next manifestation of their belief that Germany did not really lose the war, or at least was not militarily defeated. It would not be until 1920 that the Paris Peace Conference would officially end, long after the treaty with Germany had been signed, but there were many other items to take care of. When the time came, the only country still at war with Germany would be the United States. While Wilson had played such an important role in crafting the treaty, when he returned home he found he had little support in Congress to actually ratify it. The greatest reason for this was that Wilson refused to allow the Senate to amend or change the treaty, and unlike in Europe, he did not have his congressional enemy in such a desperate state that it felt the need to comply. Many of the suggested changes were crafted by the more isolationist members of the Senate, although they claimed that they were designed to ensure that the United States always had full freedom in foreign relations. Wilson, as obstinate as ever, refused to allow any modification, and so it would never be signed. It would not be until 1921 that the United States would finally sign a peace treaty with Germany, far after Wilson had left the presidency. For many Americans, the First World War would become mostly forgotten, its most enduring legacy being the laws that were put in place during America's brief time in the conflict, like the Espionage Act of 1917, which is still in force today. For the British and French, their long wars were over, and on an initial glance it looks like they had emerged from the war as strong as ever. However, the war would produce cracks in both empires that could not be easily healed. For the French, there was some concern that maybe it had not got as good of a deal as it could have from the treaty. Clemenceau was very sure that he'd done as much as he could and gotten the best possible terms, and this might have been true if the Americans had stuck to the agreement that they had made with the French and joined in a defensive agreement. The Americans would not actually honor this, and the British would use that as an excuse to pull into their usual continental detachment, leaving the French mostly alone. France's biggest problem would be in trying to actually enforce all the various clauses that had been added to the treaty. This was particularly problematic when it came to items like reparations, which would end up requiring some persuasion. But with France's two allies moving away from assisting the French, this persuasion was difficult to put into action. I quite like this quote from Edouard Hurot, who was the leader of the radical left party in France. Uh, he would say this in 1922. Quote, the position of France is lamentable. As a result of the war, we find ourselves cheated on all sides. What a paradox. Our country is portrayed as implacable and predatory at a time when it has demonstrated in reality the maximum moderation. England, on two accounts, twisted Germany's neck. It seized its colonies and seized the, and sank its fleet and is now content. Then it straightened its jacket and smiled. In France, France has returned Alsace-Lorraine, it exploits the Saar coal mines, and only wants to be paid for the ruins created by the war. France was too magnanimous with its enemy. The price of this magnanimity is that we are hated by everyone, and Germany does not pay us. The reparations question will be resolved very simply. It will have two stages. First stage, Germany is too weak and cannot pay. Second phase, Germany is too strong and will not pay. I am absolutely persuaded that in 15 years, Germany would fall upon us once again. Edouard Hurot would be off on that prediction by only two years. On the British side of things, after the war, they would be very concerned about the debt that they had accrued during the conflict. They would quickly move to reduce expenditures, even if it meant weakening their hold on pieces of their empire. 
In both cases, the leaders of both countries would soon find themselves replaced, with Clemenceau and Louis George both taken out of office in their country's next elections. After the treaty had been signed, in some ways the effects were almost immediate, at least politically, in Germany. Enough politicians in Germany realized that signing the treaty had been the only viable path forward for the country, and this had allowed the treaty to be signed. However, that agreement about not questioning the patriotism of those that had agreed to sign the treaty fell apart very rapidly. Many nationalist politicians would almost instantly begin to question those who had supported the treaty, and the questions were all about their loyalty to Germany. Most of the politicians that they were attacking were those on the moderate left, these social democrats being heavily represented. The Weimar government as a whole would slowly tack towards a position of openly criticizing the treaty, or at the very least that they could not defend it given the overall toxicity towards it among the German people. This official policy of criticizing the treaty, and the nationalists criticizing those who had agreed to sign it, was then coupled with the slow decay of public memory about how bad the situation really had been in 1919. As the years wore on, people forgot how truly dire the German situation had been in 1919, and they felt that the politicians had surrendered their position too quickly and easily. There were many results from these feelings, far too many and far too far reaching to dig in completely here, but one area that was changed was the German repayment of reparations. Throughout the 1920s, there were many economic problems in Germany, and really all over Europe. However, even those challenges in no way explained how little of the reparations bill the Germans would actually pay. Until reparations payments were stopped in 1932, the Germans had paid only 22 billion gold marks, or less than 2 billion a year. This was far less than the minimum that the Allies believed they could pay, which had been the 50 billion contained within the A and B class reparation groupings. The German government would do this by paying the absolute minimum that they could get away with, while also exacerbating the inflation that was rampant in their country and doing other actions to try and prevent the full recovery of the German economy. While performing these actions, which they knew would be harmful, they also blamed the reparations for holding the country back. In this way, from a German perspective, the exact amount of reparations that were paid over this time period didn't matter. Not at all. All that mattered was the belief that the number that was paid was enough to cripple the German economy. Sometimes I like to say that the truth doesn't matter. What people believe is the truth is what matters. And in this case, that is exactly what happened. Germany was not suffocated by the reparations payments, but because the people were told by the government and the far-right -right political parties that the country was being suffocated by them, the outcome was the same. We come now to the end of our series of episodes about the Paris Peace Conference and the Treaty of Versailles. That means we have to finish out this episode by talking something about the legacy of the treaty, and all of the treaties that were created at the conference, and also all of the work done by the leaders in Paris. To start off here, I think I have to say that while the leaders at the conference had a lot of weight on their shoulders and a lot of pressure because of it, there are, were many instances where they opted into that pressure. They wanted to remake so much of the world, some of it because they felt like they had to, but some of it because they wanted to. They wanted that power and that responsibility. It was not thrust upon them. To try and tackle an evaluation of their actions, I'm going to break their decisions up into four categories. The first will be all the decisions made about the world outside of Europe. The second is Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean. The third is everything outside of strictly geographical questions. And then the fourth is Germany. I think the area that the conference should receive the most criticism for is around how it treated the world outside of Europe, especially Africa and the Middle East. In Paris 1919, six months that changed the world, Margaret Macmillan and Richard Holbrook would say, quote, The peacemakers of 1919 made mistakes, of course. By their offhand treatment of the non-European world, they stirred up resentments for which the West is still paying today. They took pains over the borders in Europe, even if they did not draw them to everyone's satisfaction. But in Africa, they carried on the old practice of handing out territory to suit the imperialist powers. In the Middle East, they threw together peoples, in Iraq most notably, who have still not managed to cohere into a civil society. Both in Africa and in the Middle East, old-school imperialism was the rule, with politicians in Paris drawing lines on maps, even, and even if they did have good information about what was happening on the ground, they showed little concern for the people who were living in these areas. It was this lack of caring and the racism that ran throughout it that causes me to lay so much blame on the leaders at the conference for all of the problems that they caused in the Middle East and in Africa. 
I want to be clear that my criticism is not that there were unintended consequences or problems that they did not expect. Uh, with big decisions, there those are always going to happen. Uh, but I will blame them because it's clear that they didn't even care about the possible problems that they were creating. They were looking at maps and calculating square miles of territory to be gained. And that was pretty much the end of it. The second category of decisions is in Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean. In these areas, I generally have less criticism of the decisions made in Paris. Part of it is because they ended up making less truly impactful decisions, in part because the decisions that they did make sometimes didn't end up mattering because they were undone by the leaders in the area. But in some areas, they did do really good things, like trying to make sure some kind of self-determination was possible, and trying to group ethnicities together, which is what those groups wanted. But inevitably, they favored certain groups over others, and so you would get different feelings based on who you spoke to about the decisions made at the conference. The Czechs and Serbians? Big fans. But the Montenegrins and the Ruthenes had very different views after they had been placed within countries dominated by other groups. The third category is everything outside of strictly geographical concerns. The biggest thing on this list is the League of Nations. I think the League was definitely a good idea, and as a concept, is a really good idea. There were some huge flaws in the plans, and there were large problems with how it was constructed, but the idea itself was good. If anything, the countries that were required to really lead the effort were not ready for such an international organization. The League, with all of its flaws, and there would be many, would be an important step in the creation of the United Nations, even if it was mostly a step that would involve informing future statesmen about what not to do when creating an international body. The final category of decision is, of course, Germany. When I first started this podcast, if you would have asked me what I thought of the Treaty of Versailles, I probably would have told you that it was constructed in a way that lit the sparks of the Second World War. As I have learned more about the treaty and the reaction to it within Germany, I think that this is probably still accurate, but not in the way you may expect. I do not think that the treaty was overly harsh or absurd in its construction. There were reparations, but those were expected. The reparations were large, but the war had also been larger than anything that had been experienced before. Some bits of territory had been peeled off of Germany for various reasons, but this was typical of previous European wars and the vast majority of Germany remained intact. None of these items, either alone or combined together, necessarily had to lead to conflict in the future. However, the German Weimar government would believe that they would always have to take a strong anti-treaty stance to protect itself from radicals on both the right and the left. Then the French and the other allies would make some choices that did not help things along at all. But in these decisions, they were almost uniformly not strong enough with Germany in guaranteeing that the treaty terms were actually followed through on. During events like the Ruhr Crisis, they would not show the kind of unity and strength that was necessary when dealing with a nation rebelling against a previous treaty, and this just made future resistance more likely. In the years after, and especially during the 1930s, the Western governments would abandon their enforcement of demilitarization entirely, which would have the expected consequences. All of these decisions in the 1920s and 30s had nothing to do with the treaty that was created in 1919. It didn't matter what the reparations number was in the treaty. Any numbers that the citizens of the allied countries would accept would always result in the Germans saying that it was too much, and they would refuse to pay all of it. The overall structure of the treaty with Germany was built around trying to reconcile the reality of the situation with public opinion. It was certainly still possible to blame the leaders of Versailles for that public opinion, since it was mostly created and stoked by propaganda. But if those mistakes were made, then they were made far before the leaders arrived in Paris in 1919. So was the Treaty of Versailles a contributing factor that led to the Second World War? Absolutely. But it was just another item on a very lengthy list of contributing factors, and it does not stand out for its contribution to that list. Here is another quote from Paris 1919, six months that changed the world. Quote, Hitler did not wage a war because of the Treaty of Versailles, although he found its existence a godsend for his propaganda. Even if Germany had been left with its old borders, even if it had been allowed whatever military force it wanted, even if it had been permitted to join with Austria, he still would have wanted more. The destruction of Poland, control of Czechoslovakia, and above all the conquest of the Soviet Union. It's often easy, when looking at history, to try and blame future events on one decision or one group of decisions that are made by a group of people. It's just easier to think about it that way. 
but it's rarely true. History is a mess of stories and strings and contributing factors that's almost impossible to untangle sometimes. So whenever you're looking at these kind of things and you see an easy answer, like blaming the Treaty of Versailles for all of the problems in the world, well, it's probably not true. Because history is just more complicated than that. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode, which will actually not be a live episode. Over the next four weeks, I will be putting some Patreon preview episodes here on the main channel while I take a bit of a spring break, uh, which is very much needed. And then I'll be back with you in May for episode 200, which will be a little different than normal, but I think you'll really like it. And that will kick off uh, our episodes for the rest of the year, which will be around the topics after the treaty was signed and after the Paris Peace Conference conference was over around the events that sort of spooled off of the First World War. Thank you.